Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, I'm Meredith Malone. I'm the curator here at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum. And it is my pleasure to introduce the brilliant artist Chitra Ganesh. Um, it's incredible, again, to be here in person. This is our first real in-person lecture um, since the beginning of the pandemic, and I really appreciate you making your way here from New York tonight, Chitra. Um, Chitra's exhibition, titled Chitra Ganesh, Dreaming in Vol Multiverse, opened at the Kemper on February 18th, and it will be on view through July 25th. Before I continue, I want to first acknowledge that I am speaking with you from St. Louis on the ancestral lands of the Osage Nation, Missouria, Illini Confederacy, and many other tribes who are unjustly removed. We recognize these communities as we live, work, study, and benefit from the occupied land. The exhibition at the Kemper brings together a suite of Chitra's recent digital prints on view in the Seligman family atrium and five video animations screening in the video gallery on the lower level that exemplify her experimental practice of storytelling. I had the pleasure of meeting Chitra last summer and I was immediately taken with the way that she mixes myth and science fiction, interweaving this deep past and the far future, as she has told me, to grapple with our present moment of socio-political turbulence. Her wide-ranging practice engages a feminist and queer sensibility, offering multiple positions and alternate narratives within the epic worlds she creates. Her work is informed by regular travels to India with particular interest in Indian film, music, and popular culture. Combined with her upbringing in New York City, these influences yield a distinct perspective articulated in the artwork through her mixing of South Asian iconography, surrealism, science fiction, queer theory, comics, Bollywood, posters, and video games, among others. Chitra is based in Brooklyn and is Associate Professor of Studio Art at Hunter College. She earned a BA in Art, Semiotics, and Comparative Literature from Brown University in 1996. She attended the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture in 2001 and earned her MFA in Visual Arts from Columbia University in 2002. Her work has been widely exhibited both nationally and internationally, including solo presentations at the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art in New York, The Kitchen, the Rubin Museum of Art, Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Gothenburg Kunsthal, Sweden. Recent group exhibitions include the Hawaii Triennial, which she just finished installing earlier this month, um, Embodied Change, South Asian Art Across Time, which is currently on view at the Seattle Art Museum, and Born in Flames, Feminist Futures, which was at the Bronx Museum last year. Her work is widely recognized in South Asia and has been shown in New Delhi, at the Indira Gandhi National Center for Arts, the Devi Art Foundation, and Travancore Palace, in Mumbai at the Prince of Wales Museum, and in Bangladesh at the Dhaka Art Summit at Shilpa, Shilp, sorry, Shilpakala Academy. She's a recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including an Art Matters grant, Anonymous Was a Woman Award, Pollock Krasner Foundation Artist Grant, and the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship in the Creative Arts, among many others. Before I th hand things over to you, Chitra, I just want to take a moment to thank the Seitman Family Charitable Fund for their support of this exhibition at the Kemper and the accompanying programming. I also want to thank the MFA in Visual Art and the MFA in Illustration and Visual Culture programs for their co-sponsorship of this lecture tonight. So Chitra, again, I'm so happy that you're here. It's been such a pleasure to, to work with you, and I want to thank you for your incredible art. So. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, wonderful to be here and to see you all here. Thank you so much for coming to attend this talk in person. Um, I'm delighted and honored to be showing my work uh, in this museum and for your attention tonight. Um, I just realized I may need the clicker. Or is it somewhere? OK. Um, so I'm going to, oh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about the influences and development of the bodies of work that you see here in multiverse streaming, including the comics and a uh, number of animations downstairs. And then I look forward to 
speaking with you all afterwards um, for a question and answer. I want to thank Meredith, um, the Kemper Museum, the MFA programs, and all of the curatorial installation, education, facilities, security, all the teams at the museum for making this possible. So thank you all for your hard work. Um, Okay, so I, uh, this is, in this opening slide, you can see several of the themes that weave through my work that are dear to my heart, um, namely an interest in uh, graphic and print languages, um, the way in which we can uh, activate new models of storytelling and of narrative from familiar visual forms, such as comics, uh, the integration of text and image, and creating new possibilities and subject positions within these worlds. Um, should the people who are standing outside, should I wait for them to come in, or is that, no, that's not related, okay. Um, so, as, um, as Meredith mentioned, my work is, uh, is a melange of a number of different intersecting sensibilities and experiences, including that of uh, being born and raised in New York City. So oftentimes when I think about my own um, journey to and with art, I think about visual experiences that some of my very primary and strongest visual experiences which actually happen outside of an art or institutional context. So for me, probably that would have been riding the subway. Um, and this would have been maybe my first experience of seeing um, a site-specific installation. So this idea of creating work on site, of creating work that manifests um, a number of different sensibilities within the same frame that is ephemeral, that is related to uh, the architecture and the surroundings, definitely came from um, riding the subway since I was a toddler, but then also by myself from the age of 10. So, um, so alongside that, um, part of the visual sensibility of that was the, the works that I saw in an urban context, such as this kind of chalk drawing that I remember seeing waiting for the train going to elementary school. Um, and these, those kinds of um, sort of site immersive artworks were in contrast and also in relation to some of the things that I saw in my early travels to India, which were in the 80s when um, movie posters were still hand painted. So this idea of the presence of the hand um, and the relationship of the presence of the hand in these very large uh, presentational, um, highly trafficked spaces is something that's always uh, been compelling to me. So I really appreciated the way in which there were so many different um, subject possibilities and especially um, feminine subjectivity possibilities within the narrative framework of Bollywood, but also within the attendant visual culture like the posters and the costumes and some of the theatricality and the melodrama and the, the sensuality and the excess of the design of these kinds of spaces. So um, in relation to other, um, other kinds of site-specific interventions and moments that are rooted in drawing and painting, um, another form that really informs my work is this, which is called a kolam, um, which is basically a line drawing made out of um, flour. So it's flour and water, it's been, now people also create them out of sand, out of paint and other materials, but the idea is to create um, a certain kind of ephemeral design that marks a threshold between inside and outside, between public and private, as a moment of celebration. Um, it has, it actually has a visual rhyming companion in what are called veves, which are Haitian um, drawings that are also done on the ground. So in, in relation to these extremely vibrant, alive, contemporary, 
animated um, relationships to art making and site, I was really interested to think about how these moments also were grounding themselves in private spaces and also in the everyday. So this is another kind of influential image for me. This is a home altar, so you can see how the iconic and the everyday are intermingled here. So the iconic as in the deities, the everyday as in the flower petals, the rice, um, the other kinds of everyday materials that are part of this frame, even the matchboxes, um, the oil wicks, all of that. And thinking about the way um, thinking about how to combine these materialities and these icons is very much a part of my installation work, but has also moved into the way that I um, build the visual worlds that I am in in the animations as well. Um, so alongside that, I'm, I'm really happy also to be here because of the amazing um, history and the relationship that this university has to printmaking and um, print culture because those are really important aspects of my work as well. Uh, so here's an image. I noticed how icons themselves were shape-shifting travelers, not just across time, but also across media. These are two images of Kali, uh, Durga, two manifestations of the sort of divine feminine energy. This one on the left is a Kaligat painting, so that's done with gouache, watercolor, charcoal on paper. And this one on the right is a print, which is actually a party invitation for um, a puja that my family went to every year. So the way in which the epic and the mythic and the everyday um, interweave themselves has always been something that's been on my mind. And here are some more examples of that, um, of the kind of way that, that icons were not just icons and representations, but they were also everyday objects that we interacted with, and that was really important. So all of that, all of that um, sensibility in the home, the, the materiality of the everyday, was in stark contrast to the kinds of representation of South Asian femininity and art that I saw in museums and in mass culture when I was growing up in the 80s. I know things are quite different now um, in the 70s and 80s. So a lot of what I saw of, um, of South Asian female forms were very much entrenched in a deep past that did not seem connected to ongoing cultural production. Um, in relation to that, the kind of imagery um, and the confusion and the, um, I guess, the obfuscation and the ultimate erasure of certain kinds of identities was also part of that uh, imagery uh, that I grew up with. And in relation to that, I thought a lot about where can we find new possibilities that are more nuanced and um, also bring, bring more possibility for joy and exploration and thinking in a different way than some of these images that, we, that I saw of how the Western mass-mediated imagery depicted um, South Asian subjectivity. So like for example, oops, so for example, this cover is from 1985, and this one is from 2010. So you can see that in the 25 years, there actually hadn't been that much evolution in the, the way these representations were thought of. Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry about that. So in, in contrast to that, there, was, there felt like there was a lot of possibility in contemporary culture and in visual forms that were outside of the art historical canon. And so those are some of those that I work with, including comics. Um, so this is, the first, this is the first series of comics that I um, 
I created. This is part of a series, much like the series you see here, Multiverse Dreaming. Um, this is called Tales of Amnesia. So I came back to, I had always been an avid fan of comics, um, and I'd always grown up reading them, seeing comics and cartoons, and I came back to them with my, these. this is how the original comics looked. Um, in part, this was in relation to my trips to India in the summer, where the summer in India was actually a time when people were still going to school, so um, while my cousins were at school, I would be reading their comics. And these comics were made, um, were written in English because they're also in part for a diaspora and they're also in part for um, a nation of the Commonwealth um, So and the legacy of that. So looking at these comics with um, young adult eyes, I noticed that there were certain kinds of imagery that was there in the comics, a certain attention to eroticism and violence that was embedded not just in these comics but in a lot of children's stories and fairy tales and I was starting to think about that and how to sort of draw some of that latent imagery that was there out of the original comics and thinking about how this comic language which is something that I grew up reading actually um, hundreds of millions of people grew up reading um, at the same time because a few people in India is 120 million people. And also, um, these comics were read over the period of about a decade or a decade and a half by people who were of my generation and the adjacent generation. So thinking a lot about the possibility of um, this kind of a childhood visual imagery and encounter as being a very potent, uh, collectively held image bank that many of us might connect to. Whether or not, for example, in this, whether or not it's, um, it's a particular mythologic story, there's a lot of things in this image about how the comic works that we all know how to read. For example, the top of it is um, when you have that kind of rectangular box at the top, that's a third person narration. When you have a different kind of speech act, when you have something like this, it's more like a thought. You know, when you have, when you have a speech bubble versus a thought bubble and trying to use those kinds of um, the semiotics of the comic structure itself to think about new ways for objects to be talking, for different kinds of narratives to emerge from that space, and also for there to be a kind of a dissonance between the image and the text, so that they're both kind of parallel narratives that run together, and at points they may intersect, but they're also allowing it's my hope that they allow a third position, a different place for you or for the viewer to insert themselves. So in addition to comic images like this, so for this is also part of Tales of Amnesia. It ended up being a 24 page comic book where I took apart probably like my favorite 25 or 30 um, Hindu and Buddhist and other mythic stories and dissected them and reassembled them into this kind of alternative uh, surrealist narrative. So in, in relation to the idea of um, collectively held narrative imagery, um, my work is also very much influenced by other forms of text um, and relationship of text and image that are part of this, including other kinds of uh, childhood fantasy literature, fantasy and science fiction literature. So this is, um, this is actually kind of like a precursor to the internet because you would read these books and then you could choose your own ending at the end. So each story had the possibility of 
being resolved in 10 or 12 different ways. This is something that I felt very excited by to, as, as an active reader to be able to do, but also was very much reminded me of Hindu myth where, for example, the Ramayana has a couple of different endings that are possible. And so there's not the same kind of narrative stability that you would necessarily think of um, in a more linear form of storytelling. So um, other, other influences were artist books, as Meredith mentioned, um, also surrealist imagery. This is an artist book by Max Ernst, um, which combined imagery that was part of advertisements, part of newspapers, calendars, and putting them together, putting everyday images together in a very fantastical way. I was also, my work is also very much informed by um, a certain kind of comic subcultural experience that I had of actually going to places like stores and um, concert halls and fairs where you would have to physically search for the objects that you were interested in. And as I was talking about before, thinking about some of the some of the moral narrative imperatives and some of the ideas of girlhood, of femininity, of danger that are constructed by stories um, that I grew up thinking of as very benign. So it took me a long time to realize that Little Red Riding Hood is actually a kind of um, like a, caution, a tale of caution around strangers and unknown masculinity and sexual assault, for example. Um, so thinking about these is what led me to um, continue to work in this mythic realm and start to think about other ways in which mythology manifests in everyday life or in my daily life. Um, and a lot of these manifestations, so this is another series called She the Question. This, in this work, I really began to look at the visual connections between myth and science fiction, as well as the larger conceptual connections. So um, another thing I love about the comic form is how elastic it is. It has a very broad sense of address. It can command a large space because of the way the color and the form work. Um, it can also be and it can also occupy this kind of a billboard space and interrupt advertising. But it can also be um, something that you look at in your lap or in your bedroom or while you're in the bathroom. So there's a combination of a public and an intimate way of engaging with this material that, um, that's exciting to me. Let me go back here. So um, my work is also informed by other kinds of print languages like psychedelic po music posters from the 60s and 70s, other moments where I noticed there were certain kinds of east-west connections being forged visually in uh, popular history. And um, I was interested also in thinking about how to create uh, multiple narratives within the same frame in addition to thinking about how stories unfold across frames. So I wanted to go back to this. Another thing that I'm really interested about in comics is this idea of the gutter. The gutter is the space in between two images and it's, it's that space and how the images are juxtaposed between that space that often creates the meaning. So thinking about how, um, how meaning gets created by some of the gaps and also how in an installation version the work can be read in multi-directionally. Okay, so how are we doing? Um, I'm going to move forward to um, looking at some of these other images. So these are some more works where you see the relationship between myth and science fiction. That UFO kind of shape in the top is actually based on the architecture of the parliament of India in New Delhi. It's just inverted and spinning around. Um, and some of these other cave-like images are also based in um, historical monuments. 
So one of the things I was really interested about in science fiction when I was younger was the way in which difference and alterity was embedded into the narrative. So it wasn't necessarily about the race or identity of the characters that you see here, but it was, it was a way in which that multiplicity could exist within a larger group or community structure, which was one of the first places that I actually saw representations like this. I was also really interested in how both myth and science fiction use this idea of cyclical time. So that time and progress isn't something that goes from this point to this point, as we see in the past two years or the past 10 years or your whole life alive, um, but that things go in a much more cyclical and circuitous fashion. And I had this aha moment about this when I was watching um, Battlestar Galactica years ago, and I realized that the very end of it is also the very beginning. And I, I looked at, um, I looked at the Odyssey, and I realized this idea of starting in media race in the middle of everything, in the middle of the story, is also the way Star Wars is structured as well. So, I was thinking a lot about that. Um, I want to. So here, these are some more images that are part of the visual vocabulary that I use that you can see in bits and pieces recurring in multiverse dreaming. This moment of combing hair is one of those. It's a kind of moment, a quiet moment, a moment of reflection, a daily ritual, something that, um, a moment of pause or something that we don't necessarily see publicly or presentationally is one example of that. Um, so I wanted to talk about, now I'm going to talk about the works that you're seeing in this show. Uh, so there's five animations downstairs that are part of, um, and three of those are part of the Scorpion Gesture, which was a suite of animations that I created that was initially commissioned at the Rubin Museum in New York, and they were very much interested in looking at how a lot of the very, very old Buddhist narratives, some of them quite ancient, had futurity and speculation embedded into those narratives. So um, the, the focus of my research for these projects is a figure called Padma Sambhava, who you see here, and he was called, he's um, popularly known as the second Buddha, but this is the guy who brought Buddhism from South Asia to Tibet. And part of what I noticed in his story is that in his biography, it is written that every 300 years, new literature and new texts will be unearthed. So this idea of future and speculation is already embedded in his life story. And so I was very interested in that and in thinking with a lot of these objects that are in the museum to think about how we can harness some of these elements to connect something that feels like it's very much tethered to a past that doesn't have relevance to us right now and how those can be reactivated in a contemporary moment. So the works were originally a motion activated site specific animation so when you would when you were looking at the work and you would walk up there, the animation would kind of come on. And so it would be an, another reality, another dimension of the, the visual language that you see here. And I felt like a lot of that language in those Thangka paintings, which is what those paintings are called, everything is so tightly interlocked. It's hard to sometimes get a handle on how they connect or pull individual elements out. And that was one of the things that I had fun with doing um, in the animation. So here are um, a couple more stills. The animations were in relation to objects in the Rubin Museum's collection. Something I really enjoyed about working with these objects is that they were thought of as objects of art rather than historical artifacts. And I think that that was an important differentiation for me because 
they were objects of art that were circulating with and among other objects of art rather than archaeology, and with and among contemporary art as well. Um, something that I also really love about the Manil collection and how that place is hung as well. Um, so I'll just show a couple of the animations now. Um, so wait, we're going to stop in 10 minutes, right? Probably 6.45? Okay. And I'll talk through it a little bit after. Um, so as you can see, the animation itself is cyclical, so there's not really a starting and a stopping point. Um, the beginning is also the end. And so one of the things that I was interested in with this work, which is called The Adventures of the White Barrel, is the white barrel itself, which you see on the left side here, which was a cosmological, astrological manuscript that was discovered several hundred years after its publication and took a very long time and a number of scholars to decode. Um, but a lot of the imagery that you see in the animation is taken from the white barrel. So when the woman is uh, juggling, those are the different elements like wood, earth, metal, wind, the different kinds of Chinese elements. And then you also saw the animals, which represent the different years, like the year of, for example, we're in the year of the tiger now. But one of the things I was really interested in about this is um, thinking about how astrology and cosmology was something that people really held on to at the time when this was made because of the chaos in their world. And it reminded me um, so much of the increasing popularity of astrology and of tarot and other alternative non-organized, um, non-officially organized belief systems that people are turning to today. And another thing that I really, um, loved about it, which actually the last few years seems to have brought true, is that in this astrological manuscript, life was described as a series of pitfalls or possible um, conflicts and contaminations to be avoided. So this idea of moving through life defensively, trying to make your way from one point to the other, basically without um, getting yourself in harm's way, uh, is also part of what inspired me to think about the video game format that you see at the end, and then became some 
a lens through which I also experienced the last couple of years along with everyone else. Um, I think I should actually, I'll just keep going. I don't think I'll show another animation, but I'll just, I'll just keep moving forward so you guys can see some more stuff. Um, this, is, this is another work which is called uh, The Rainbow Body. And part of the, so part of how I made my work was by reading the different biographies of Padma Sambhava and thinking about how female characters do or don't figure into um, this, the, the way in which he is built up as this particular figure. So one of the figures um, who is very influential to his development is this, um, is this princess that he meets and they meditate together in a cave for six months. And so that idea of them hanging out in this cave and meditating and having sex is basically what the rainbow body is and is crucial to his enlightenment. And then when they, and then they part ways and then he goes on to do his thing and she goes on to do her um, ruling class thing. So um, that you'll see downstairs. So I wanted to talk also a little bit about um, I'll just move to multiverse dreaming, maybe. So this exhibition at the Rubin, by the way, um, so it had animations in it, but it also, sorry, let me go back for a minute. Okay, um, so the animations were also interested in thinking about how visual language of science fiction, um, both vintage and contemporary, informs our ideas of the future and futurity. So I wanted to, um, so I created a number of prints and works on paper, and I also was looking at science fiction movie posters from outside of the US and thinking about how those were part of this visual language that I was thinking about and part of that um, idea of how futures can manifest in multiple iterations depending on where in the world you are or what your position is. Um, I also commissioned so I tried to get some of these older science fiction posters into the museum as part of my exhibition and they were so expensive I felt that a better use of the money would be actually to commission younger artists who might not have had a museum show before to create their own science fiction movie posters. So that's part of what you see here in that show. The Scorpion Gesture was also shown in Times Square. So. Um, it was really amazing to see how this kind of animation language interrupted the advertising language that you see in the digital billboards that dominate your perspective when you're at street side there. Um, so I wanted to show this comic. Uh, this is called Anima Mundi, which which basically is talking about the relation. Anima Mundi is a way to talk about the relationship between all living things, um, and this, in some way, is the point of origin for multiverse dreaming. So. The multiverse dreaming series is something that I worked on over the course of about a, a year and a half or a couple of years, but very intensely for um, between 2020 and 2021. So this comic, I'll just read the text out. It says, for the longest time, the sight of magnolias blooming could only evoke a Ma's death. Um, now a spring like no other. Listen to the sound of the earth moving. That's what that postcard says. It's actually a Yoko Ono artwork. Um, Last week passed like sand through my fingers, a symphony of sirens and bird song, a story of what lies between language. And these words no longer for her alone. 
see you on the other side. So I, um, I made this comic as a commission that was part of Creative Time at the beginning, at the spring of 2020 during the lockdown. And it was, the text is literally what I was thinking, which is that every year um, since I was 23, the spring reminds me of my mother's passing. Every time I saw Magnolias, that's what I would think about. And in 2020, that was upended by the pandemic. And I knew that my sense of orientation around the spring is something that would change. And it made me start to think about the, the way in which, especially during the pandemic, we were living in multiverses, depending on age, depending on class, depending on location, depending on um, able-bodied or health issues. And so thinking about that idea of how one orientation could be radically shifted uh, is something that inspired the works that you see up here. So the first time I showed this work was at the Bronx Museum. Um, the, the initial image that you see here, which is called Urgency, is something that I originally, well, you'll see these over there, but this image, Urgency, is something that I developed over um, 2020 as well. And I was thinking a lot about archetypes, about the idea of iconologia, of, a, of an idea or a moral value um, that was embodied into a figure, into a person. And so I thought that if there had to be a value of the moment, um, of that moment, it would have been urgency for me. And it was urgency to see people running out of their apartment buildings with tiny cardboard signs going to protest uh, the death of George Floyd after having not interacted with humans for months on end. So those kinds of moments made me think about urgency. The work was shown as part of a public um, exhibition in New York. And the so a lot of these works and this text was also born of thinking about more of the relationship between ourselves and our environment, something that is happening on a larger global level and also was happening on a more granular level as people were not taking any kind of transportation and they were just literally walking around and walking around the park as I was um, in Prospect Park. Um, and I think another thing that was, another way in which this work became a, a kind of a compass for me over the time in which it was made was it also um, bridged, I, I created the work before, during, and after my father's death, uh, which also happened in 2021 during the pandemic. So the, um, the sense of these images being a container for all of these different multiverses that were happening, that were happening for me, but also the radically different experiences that others were having during the time also informs, um, informs the work. So here this says, that night it seemed a mountain had disappeared from its station, walked away from the horizon once and for all. That night time unfurled itself like a parachute, extending from her fingertips fluttering like a torn sail. Um, so I think I should probably stop here um, and then we can, keep, we can keep talking amongst us. I would love to hear from you guys if you have any questions or thoughts. Um, either about this work or about other things that I've presented and other aspects of my practice, I uh, would love to hear from you. So thank you so much for your attention. Yeah. Um, 
Um, so in some cases, so I, I also, um, writing is an important part of my work, not just writing, but um, translation and the possibilities and the shortcomings of translation. So that's in part growing up um, bilingually and being trilingual, but also in part in relation to studying translation and poetic translation and thinking about the idea that um, there's never a one-to-one -one relationship between the original and the translation, but rather that the translation itself is like a collage of sorts, of just trying to assemble a new way of looking at this together that is comfortable in the language into which it's being translated. So the, there's like often a slight dissonance between the image and the text, unlike in traditional comics where the text really orients you to understand who the characters are, what they're doing, what the before of that was, even if that's through a sound effect or something like that. And so that, um, that sense of having um, more interior monologue um, and having more stream of conscious or diaristic writing or thinking is part of my approach to text, which is uh, poetic also. So in some cases, there, um, the work, the image and the text, let me see if I, if I see. Oh, no, we're going in a wrong direction. Oops, sorry, it's very wrong. Okay. Um, in some instances, like with this image, the some of the text had, had existed in um, little snippets before the image, but the text really came together when the layers of the image world um, pulled themselves together. And then in other instances, the text had been more of the inspiration for the image itself. And then in even other works, um, like this one, it didn't feel like it needed a uh, text at all. So there are some images where, because the other images have text, I hope that it also feels punctuated by silence um, in a different way. So I just pulled these two up because I realized this this idea of like the combing of the hair and the thinking about things at night, which is something that I did as um, a child. I would have this I would have this fear that after my hair was combed and I was sent to bed, that my parents um, would be in the closet as skeletons. So it's actually just literally something that then came into my work which I hadn't thought about in a long time. And um, in this case, the text is, um, is sort of in relation to myself, but is also thinking about a tradition of poetry and songs where often the name of the author is embedded into the text. Um, it's also very common for myth as well, like the name of the author or multiple authors is there inside, uh, inside and at the end of the text. Um, yeah, so, yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking, speak, speak about translation. When you're making these, are you, are you starting from drawings? Are you starting from collage, recreation? Um, I'm usually starting from some kind of drawings. Um, and then some of that is also, and I also play around with, the collage at the same time. So I think the, you know, in the previous image, there was an image of a cat meditating. Like that is an image that has been active and being explored in my work um, as a figure over the last couple of years and then kind of came into this sphere. Um, these images like that I had shown from the comic, which are part of this later installation were also um, images that I drew during, uh, based on observation or um, observation of myself, so, yeah. And then when there's an image drawn, do you scale it up and then do it in printed, or is there more collage that occurs? 
both. So I, I draw um, I draw on a tablet as well as in with paper. So I often will like scan in. I often just start with a notebook, um, you know, graph paper kind of notebook, and then I'll just take the image and scan it in. And in that way, it follows a traditional comic process where it's penciled and then it's inked and then it's colored. And in some of those instances, I will actually just take fragments from the old comics. But part of what I um, also am doing is like I create these um, like textures that I can paint with so that it has the feeling of the materiality of older comics and something that doesn't feel like CGI imagery. So that flatness and that sense of line quality and outline and the printing process is like an important part of what I want for the viewer to f viscerally experience like the work. Yeah, um, how do you create those textures? And uh, also, where do you get your half tones? Do you create those as well? Or the captions? The half tones? The, the half tones, yes. So I, I paint with um, I paint with these textures. Like I create, they're much larger swatches that I created from high scanning of old comics that were four color printed. <coughs> And then I manipulated those textures, so then I just used the paintbrush with that texture, with the halftone texture as well. And then when there's a couple of these, not from this series, but from a different series where they're printed, they're silkscreen printed. So in that case, the halftone is actually like in the printing process. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. It has been really great. Um, I noticed that in a lot of your subjects, there's like cuts or like scars. Um, and in the, in the animation from those scars, kind of enters or appears another figure. So, can you tell us a little more about uh, your understanding of that uh, scar, that cut, the, the, the relationship between pain and maybe bird? Yeah, I think that. Um, so one of the one of the ways in which I think about that or that made me think about that was thinking about how in there are so many different creation stories where the figure of the mother or the father was taken apart to form the world. So like you see this in like a Norse creation myth where the you know the hair becomes the branches and these different parts of the body become either architecture or nature. Um, so I was thinking about that. And also thinking about the idea of, um, you know, something growing out of either pain or decay or um, some kind of precarity or violence. And that still is, um, is a place where things generate, generate themselves. Yeah, hi. So, I don't know if you have a lot of comments, they show a lot of like brutalization of women and marginalized parts and things like that. So, what do you respond to that? Can you say that again? I don't know if you have a lot of comments, they show a lot of brutalization of women and people from marginalized parts and things like that. So, how do you respond to that or deal with that in your Um. So, I think that one of the things that I was interested in is like how women are often catalysts to move the story forward. Like, you know, for example, Draupadi, or for example, Rama losing Sita. Like these kinds of things, like the somehow the loss or the threat of the loss of the woman is a way to move the narrative forward. And so for me, one of the things that I was thinking about was also how those characters would not be excised from the margins, but would be like actors and protagonists in their own right within the comic. Um, and I think I thought also a lot about how um, 
which it, it doesn't at, apply as much in my work because m many of the depictions are of women and femininity, but it also led me to think a lot about how certain kinds of facial features, facial hair, skin tone, are actually um, inscribing like caste and class in the original comics. And so part of that is also what I was interested in moving beyond. Um, I think, so I was thinking a lot about hand gestures as being sort of like a, their own language. I mean, not just in terms of, I mean, we see that in something like ASL, but also in terms of how uh, something like a mudra uh, is used in, which is a, a hand gesture that has a specific meaning, would be used in um, performance, in dance. Um, in theater and would have a language of its own. So thinking about the importance of that, but not necessarily using those gestures that are already existing, but creating a new sort of language for that. Like this also, I think about in that same way. Thank you guys so much for your time and attention. I really appreciate it.